I am an engineer at Puppet. I have been an engineer, an engineer at Puppet for about 18 to 20 months now. Um, I love working on the modules team, so if you've ever pushed anything up to the community, um, up to the forge, up to any of the supported modules, or anything namespaced under Puppet, then I have probably reviewed your, your code and merged it. Um, a little bit further about my background, I actually lived in San Diego for a while, so if you recognize me from San Diego 10 years ago, then um, that's maybe some of that. Um, I'm really gonna go through, the whole point of this talk is to explain how simple it is to do something really powerful in Puppet. And a lot of the concepts here are really simple, and there isn't much code, but it can be incredibly effective. So I'm gonna take you through this. So what we have here is, um, I'm gonna take you through how all this started, and there's a bit of a story to it all. I'm gonna talk you through how you eventually start to write puppet code after you're dealing with um, something simple like a, a JSON REST API. I'm gonna show you some live coding, which could go phenomenally wrong, so um, be prepared to have a good laugh at that. But then I wanna talk about, after you've written this, what, what's really interesting is whenever you give it out to the community and put it up on GitHub or put it up to the Forge and how to make life easy for other people. And then the next question is, if we can write a small amount of code to do something cool like this, then what can we do with it? How can we extend this? Where does it become incredibly powerful? So, next slide. So, where all this started. So, the story is, as, you, as I told you, I am a puppet engineer. Um, I got hired out of Belfast, and it all started with these people. So, you may recognize some of the faces there. Um, the Belfast office has been going for about two years. Um, you'll probably um, recognize David Schmidt in the front there, or DevLOps. Um, any module that you've ever touched ever, um, he probably had a helping hand in. So, um, he's a great guy, and I've learned a lot from him. Um, the other thing I would say is, um, we, that space that you see there looks really pretty. Um, the Belfast office was there, and really there's only, there were four rooms, and we were all crammed into four tiny rooms. So what that kind of enforced is we wanted to move office. So whenever we moved office, we moved into an old linen mill. So Belfast was famous for making linen many, many years ago. And uh, basically, we got this really cool space, and we got this really, really cool kitchen, and we decided, why not put in some really, really cool lampshades? And as soon as I saw the lampshades, so these lampshades from Ikea, they look like Death Stars. You can even buy decals to make them look totally like Death Stars. <laughs> so they are the coolest thing ever. We were playing with the idea of maybe putting in some adrenos so we can get them to open and close. Um, but as soon as I saw them, I fell in love with them, and I forced our... <clears throat> We've, well, I forced our office manager basically to buy them, and I went, we can make these really cool if we get colored light bulbs in there. So, the sheer experience is super, super awesome. There are so many cool things that you can do with it. Basically, what there is is these two light bulbs in here, and they're just simple light bulbs. They're a bit expensive, they're about $15, and they come with a little hub, which you can see there. Um, the hub plugs into your network, and it can control up to about 50 light bulbs. So I was going, this is the way to go. It's cheap and cheerful, and it made our office look really cool. So as I said before, these light bulbs are programmable. You can make them change color. You can make them flash. You can make them do all sorts of things. But where we were really interested in this was, well, Apart from it being fun in the office, and if we're having a beer in the office, it's kind of cool, maybe we want to hook it up to our build servers. What would happen if we could get alerts coming through on our lights whenever we're working in the kitchen that our build server is down, or our build failed? So I started thinking about, well, this could actually be really, really, really cool. And we have an IP address. Puppet does great things with IP things, 
So we have Puppet device, we have Puppet um, cloud modules. I wonder if we could maybe extend this. So what we then have to do is, can we actually play with anything? What can we play with? So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go to the command line and I'm gonna go to another terminal. And can everyone read that? No, let's, let's blow that up. So what I'm gonna do now is I am gonna do uh, this. So uh, I have an environment variable which stores the IP of my Hue Hub. And then I also have another environment variable which stores the key. Ah, man. Never do a live demo. Ah, there we go. So what the Hue key does is basically it's an API key. It's a, a key that you generate whenever you touch the box. And what's really cool about it is it makes it secure. The box itself isn't available to the internet unless you want it to, but it makes sure that you have a unique developer attachment to these particular lights. So I have the two pieces of information that are required to t contact these um, lights. And so what I'm gonna do is a really simple command, which is I want to see this on the internet. So this is a simple, well, open, I'm on a Mac, and basically what this is gonna do is open up a web page for this Hue Hub, and it's gonna open it up for this particular developer key. So things will go like that. So what we have here is we haven't written any code yet, but what we've shown is this device is available over the internet, and it has given us information about these lights. So what we can actually see is we can see that we have a light bulb, we have its brightness, we have its hue or color or saturation, and we have different effects on it. So we know we can contact this device, so why don't we do something really, really interesting with it? So that's not really that interesting because we're not doing anything with it, so I need to swap back into present. The next thing is, how do we actually do something really fun with it? Sorry, there was a joke there, I didn't. Yes, curl is awful. Um, I'm gonna show you how to use curl, and curl is basically your way into people's developer, or into an API generally. If you're programmatically trying to interact with devices, you can do it through code itself by inserting debug, but generally you will always fall back to curl. Um, there is no two ways about it, and generally getting, get, getting to know curl is fun. So, I'm gonna show you some curl. So I'm pretty much running the same command again, but I am piping it into JQ to make things pretty. So the information that we're gathering back now, rather than it just being a dumb web page where you can't read anything, what's really cool about it is you can actually start to see key value pairs, things that Puppet could potentially start to understand and you start to see a structure there that could, well, does that start to almost look like puppet code where you're going, here's an attribute and here's a value. So you start to see, well, I wonder how easy it would be to put that into puppet. So, so curl is really bad. There is an API debugger built into the Hue Hub, which is really cool. It's a little web page and you can pass chunks of JSON and it gives you helpful errors. No other piece of software or vendor device will ever give you a nice API debugger. This is really, really fun, and it's really cool. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about is the Big Bang moment, and the Big Bang moment is literally a Big Bang episode. So whenever I took this device home, I was going, this is the coolest thing ever. I can turn off the light bulbs from across the room from on the internet, from San Diego, and I was talking to my wife and I said, really see this here, I'm gonna change this light bulb 
through curl, and she just went, what? And she just went, I can just go up and do that. <laughs> so it's a case of, yeah, it's kind of cool, but it's not cool yet. So how do we make it really, really cool? The other thing to say is, I was talking about having JSON there. Manually munging JSON and using that isn't a nice experience. What is nice is Puppet code. And you can write really ugly, ugly Puppet code, and we could have just put all of this into an exec. Do we really want to do this in an exec? No, uh, that's not sustainable. So moving forward, what do we really want to do? We want to write nice Puppet code. So now we know we can contact the device or contact the Hue Hub via REST or via HTTP. Um, let's see if we can actually break it using Puppet. So what I'm going to talk about first is FOSS software is totally cool. Um, and not all these modules are completely FOSS, but the other ones are. Um, F5 isn't FOSS. It's a PE only module. It is also cool. But why I'm pointing these out is these modules all operate in a very, very similar way. They all have a REST JSON interface into those devices. So that's how I came up with the idea of puppetizing these lights. Um, the other thing that I should talk about here is these modules all work in an agentless fashion. There is no agent running on this Hue Hub that costs 100 pounds or 100 dollars. It is agentless, so that means that we don't have to worry about getting C support for this particular hub. Agentless is really, really cool. So we're next going to do, well, the very next thing is, how simple will it actually be to puppetize this? So if you look here, we can see that Netscaler has a whole lot of lines. F5 has a whole lot of lines. NetApp has a whole lot of lines. And my module has uh, 648 lines of code. Now, what I will stress is, I think there's only maybe 48 lines of useful code in there. All the rest of it is things that you really should be doing to encourage users to use your module and also developers to work on your module. So that's things like documentation, spec tests, um, and uh, all the, the work that goes into, or all the work that wraps around your module to make it easy to run. So I have used like really cool new modules out there like Rototiller and other things to make your automation easier. All your acceptance tests to run easier and that first 10 minutes of trying to use a new module, make it easy. So whenever you try and do something, it will shout at you. So, the next thing that we have to really do is look at what is our MVP? What are, what is, what are the things that we are actually going to do to make these light bulbs sing or change color? They don't sing yet. They might do. Um, so really how Puppet works is there are two really important things that we are interested in whenever we're talking to a device. The first piece of information that we're really in, in sort of super interested in is we need to find the state of the device. And that's really important whenever we're talking about item potency. The other piece of information that totally makes sense because a puppet module that doesn't do anything is useless. So we need to be able to set the state. So I've written out some pseudocode there of what will actually happen. But pretty much all that happens is we're going to do a get via HTTP, and we'll also do a put via HTTP. There's not much there. It's really, really dumb. So whenever we're talking about getting stuff, what we're actually talking about is the puppet resource command. And whenever we're talking about setting something, it directly maps to puppet apply. So I'm going to talk a little bit about types and providers, because I'm not writing all this in native puppet. It, this is all going to be written in Ruby. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about types and providers. And hopefully, I don't bore people who know everything about this. But the whole point of this talk is to talk, uh, is to talk to talk to talk, is to talk to talk to talk. 
the whole point of it really is to just to explain how simple it is. And really, there isn't much code. There's a lot of files, but there isn't much code. So what is actually happening here is we have three main files that are going to do all the work. We have a type, and that describes all the attributes. So earlier, whenever we were looking, we saw that there was a brightness attribute, there was the hue attribute, there was the effect attribute. And that's basically like a C header file. It doesn't actually, it doesn't have any code in it unless you're doing some validation, but in mine, it doesn't do anything. It's just listing the attributes. The next thing is the provider itself, and that's what's gonna do the work. When we said before about doing the get and the set, that's where the code lives. The other really cool piece of, um, the other really important part is the parent class. And that parent class, what that actually does is that creates the HTTP connection. So we're gonna use a Ruby library to do that, and then we're gonna have separate helper methods that are actually gonna get the HT or get, get the JSON from the Hue device, and then the other one will be putting the JSON onto the device. So that will be the puppet apply and puppet resource. So that's pretty much it. So I'm gonna take you through the code itself. And basically what we have here is our type, and this is the code itself. It is dumb. There isn't much there. What we're gonna, we have three pieces of information here. The name of the light, whether or not the light is turned off or on, and another property called the hue, which is a posh word for color. Um, the next thing that we're gonna talk about is the provider. And as we said before, there are two parts of a provider, really. There's the getter and the setter. And in reality, what they're called is self.instances self and flush. The self.instances, basically all it really does is make a get request against the Hue hub, as in HTTP, the IP address, the API key, and then lights, and that will return some JSON. And then we have the flush, which is the set. And that's where we construct a chunk of JSON that will be sent out to the, the Philips Hue Hub itself. There isn't much code there. And in reality, it's really quite simple. Um, you don't have to come up with this all the time. And the other important thing is, once you write this provider code once, you will notice that all your different resources will be copying and pasting this. There, it's just changing the attribute names. There isn't much to do. Once you break the back of writing a module and handling a single resource, the other resources fall into line really simply. So at the minute we're controlling a Philips light bulb, we could equally control a Philips light switch or any other device. <clears throat> um, the way that I've written it here as well is in um, it's an all-in-one flush and self.instances. If you were really interested, you could have single attributes being set at a time. Um, but I just took the lazy way out for here. This is the ugly side. Um, it isn't that ugly, but really what it's breaking down into is Ruby code. And there isn't much Ruby code here. There isn't much code at all. We have three methods here. We have create a connection, and we use Faraday for that. So it's one line of code that you'll write once forever and then you probably will never change it again. And then we have our two helper methods. One to get your JSON and one to set your JSON. So they're really, really simple bits of code. There's a little bit of munging in there, but we can ignore that. That's because the Philips Hue Hub was a little bit weird about Booleans. Please ignore that. <clears throat> so I spoke a lot about types and providers there. There are lots of really great blog posts on there on types and providers. There is great amounts of Puppet documentation, but I don't read documentation very well. I like to read people's real life stories, and these are the best things that I've seen out there. <clears throat> um, the other thing that I will say is I didn't write this from scratch. I didn't start with a blank text file. What I really did was I copied. I copied another module and I ripped out lots and lots and then I put in my code. And that works so much easier and that's how I work. I would love to say that I'm the greatest software architect in the world, but I literally hack stuff together. So 
I'll hold my hands up to that. So, <laughs> yeah. Whenever I said it's easy to do, the next really difficult thing is setting up your environment for testing this. And it is not that easy. You set out with your best intentions, and then it's going to get really messy. It isn't too bad. It does actually get bad, better. And what I'm saying about copying other modules, it's not copying. It's just getting you started. You're not copying all the code. You're just copying its structure. And that's what makes life a lot easier. I don't think that there are many projects in there that have started with zero code. Please use free and open source software, and please use it responsibly. But it does help you along. So what then happens after you set up your environment? And after you've got your first attribute working, you're going to do this. It's going to be rinse and repeat over and over and over again. So what you've done is we met whenever I first started writing this, I controlled the state of turning it off and on. After that, I added the attribute of color. And then after that, I'll add another attribute. And then after that, I will add another resource that copies the type and the provider. And I'll just change the URL a slight bit. It's really just rinse and repeat after that. The first part of writing a module is not difficult. You should copy from someone else. Copy from other good authors. Do not copy from me. <laughs> so I've spoken about this a bit. Let's see what we can do with the light bulbs itself. So I do have a joke as well, which is how many engineers does it take to change a light bulb? One. The real answer is, how many light bulbs can I change at once now? I can change 50 light bulbs at once. So that's pretty good productivity. So I'm going to flip to the command line, and we're going to have a play. So this is a virtual machine. I love testing. So this is all set up through Vagrant. And I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some code running. So first of all, I'm going to clear this. Is the font big enough for you guys? Big enough. Ah, oh, make it bigger again. OK. So we're going to start running some puppet commands. So oh, I need to remember the name of the resource. And it's called Hue Light. And don't type and talk at the same time. So what we were talking about there was we had attributes in JSON. We have then copied that over into a type and provider. And we have some attributes here. So we can see Hue Light 1, which I think is this one. Probably not. And we have Hue Light 2. But you can actually already see that those two colors are different. And they're represented by those attributes. So the next thing that we would probably want to do is do something cool. And I'm going to do the really typical puppet thing where what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy and paste this into a file. So I'm going to vim a new file, which is going to be demo time. I'm going to paste this in. I'm going to change shoe light bulb 1 to 0. And 0 should be red. And if it isn't, I will be red faced. So we're going to do our next thing, which is going to be a puppet apply. And we're going to do our demo. <gasps> it works. So yes, you have no idea how many hours of sleep that I've lost over worrying about this demo. So what we can do <laughs> is we have a red light bulb now. So what's really cool, though, is we can now do that and make them blue. And then we can make them green. And so what we're really showing in here is the power of Puppet. So this is a really contrived, simple demo. but. You can start to see why this becomes really interesting really, really fast. So if you can do this with a simple light bulb, imagine what you could do elsewhere. So the next real thing is, why don't we add some new functionality? So we have off and on, which I didn't show off and on because I have light switches. We don't need to do that via public code. Let's add new functionality. Let's see what would be really cool to do. So I'm going to give you a little story here. So this is Max. 
Max is a f my friend's son, which makes me feel incredibly old. Um, he came to Puppet. He is 15 years old. He has never coded. He never used a Mac before. He didn't know about virtualization. He doesn't know about JSON. He didn't know anything. He was in Puppet for a week to learn whether or not he wanted to decide to go into computers. So what I decided to do was make him a member of the open source community and make him have his first commit. So within a week, this 15-year-old who had never coded, never used a Mac, doesn't know what JSON really is, doesn't really understand the complexity of what we have just done, but what he was able to do was add in the color attribute. It's simple enough for other people to be able to add things, and that's what's really powerful about Puppet and open source, where you may come up with an idea, but you want to open it up for others to add and build on your stuff. That's why it's brilliant. So now that we've spoken about how a 15-year-old can do my job better than me, um, let's add proper functionality. So we've got these colored lights, but we want disco. Let's make it disco. So do you like the GIF? That's a classy GIF. So um, this is ripped directly out of the Philips Hue API. And what we have here is an attribute called effect. And what we're going to do is we're going to add in this attribute and see what happens. So currently, there are two states for this attribute, which is none and color loop. So let's see what color loop does. Hopefully, it'll do something fun. Uh, hopefully, it won't break. And so what I'm going to do is do more stuff. So I'm going to show you a few other things while I'm here. So we're going to go back to the command line. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a edit some code. This is the puppet code, that the provider code, which contains the getters and setters. So what I'm going to do is not actually add any code yet. I want to show you some of the tricks. So whenever people are writing code, specifically in types and providers, the first thing that everyone needs to do is put pry in. So let's see what we can find out with pry. So I'm going to type incredibly badly. Um, you guys can all laugh at everything that I type. And hopefully this doesn't take too long. OK, so you've all probably laughed at how many keys I can hit at once. And what we're going to do is we're going to run this again. So I'll do it clear. So I don't know how many of you guys have seen Pry before, but Pry is the greatest thing ever. I came from Java and C++ and Python before and other things I don't want to mention. But this is probably one of the nice debug nicest debuggers I've ever used. And so what we can really do is we can do things like this, ls, and find out all our instance variables, arrays, and other Ruby things that I don't really understand, but it's cool. What's really nice, though, is I can do this and have a look at one of the variables, and I can see all that JSON that we were getting previously via curl or via the API or via our URL request in Chrome, but it's now inside Ruby. It's now so close to being inside Puppet. So we can actually start to see what's interesting here. And if we have a look, we can see effect here is set to none. So this is literally starting to write the code for us. We can see what the attributes are and what is available to us from the Philips Hue. And now what we can do is we can start to put that into Puppet code. So what I'm going to do now is I don't care about that. I am now going to write some code. And what I'm going to do is I am going to write my type. So previously, we had our three attributes. Now I'm going to add a third one. So people can now laugh at my Vim skills. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in a new piece of code called effect. And because I'm a good person, I'll actually change the documentation as well. 
Hopefully that's right. So the next bit of code that we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to change our provider. And so earlier we spoke about self.instances. This is our getter or what is actually used in our puppet resource whatever. So what's great about this is I literally don't have to write code. I can copy and paste lines and that's what we want to do. I hate being smart and I have never really been smart to start with. So what I'm now gonna do is do another clear and we're now gonna do a resource or, oops, uh, do another resource. Oh, syntax error, unexpected keyword end. Okay, that's helpful. Could you tell it's a live demo? Okay. Okay, so we're back at our, our break point. Let's skip through. And now we have a new attribute in there by adding two lines of code. Super powerful, Puppet is fantastic. You don't have to do a whole lot to get things to be really powerful. The really interesting thing now is that's not great because we haven't, we can't set this yet. Let's make sure we can set it. So we now need to go back into our provider. And what we're gonna do again is we're gonna copy and paste code. So we're gonna have effect in here. We don't need to convert to an integer. And what we're gonna now do is run, ah, I'll ignore this. I'm gonna run puppet apply again because it's kind of interested or interesting and to see what happens whenever you do a puppet apply. So we already have our code here. And I'm gonna write another res or another manifest. We're gonna change our attribute to be, whoa, let's have a look. What is it, I think it was called color loop. American color or I doubt it. American color. American color. So I'm not gonna do a puppet apply on demo two. And you're gonna see something important here. And this is the most important part about writing puppet code. This is showing the item potency of it. So we don't just set state, we check the state first to see if anything's changed. So what we've done now is we've grabbed all the resources and what we're gonna do is see if anything's changed. So, after I skip through, we have now told it to do something clever. So it should be disco bulb, and we have disco bulb. So it's maybe not as flashy as we need it, but I wasn't sure if, um, yeah, epilepsy. Epilepsy warning I didn't wanna have to give. So what I'm gonna now do is I have another one called effect.pp. So I'm gonna run both of them in loop mode hopefully. So now we have both of them going in different colors at different times, which is also awesome. So I hopefully what I showed you there was, it is simple to do this. Um, the live coding hopefully a bit. Um, hopefully I've showed you there that despite my typos and adding an extra end there, adding extra attributes into types and providers and device modules is actually really easy. It allows you to add huge amounts of functionality very, very quickly. So we now have a, fun a functioning module, but that's not really enough. That just means that we can do things. It doesn't mean that we can get anyone else really to use our module because we haven't put it anywhere and we haven't done anything fun for it. So what we really wanna do is make it useful for users and also developers that are gonna look at this. So I'm just gonna talk very briefly about how to make things easy for your users. First thing is have a readme. Completely obvious, but you want to make people using your, man or your module really super easy. You want to make sure that those first 10 minutes are just super, super easy. Um, 
The other thing that you want to make sure is you want to make sure your dependencies are sorted out. So that's your Ruby and your gem dependencies. So it means that other people with completely different environments can get the same results. There is nothing worse than taking someone else's code and realizing that they're missing bits and pieces and trying to get that environment up and running is really horrible. The other thing to remember if you're dealing with devices is to remember and specify what version of the application you're using. So that really helps. So if you're supporting version X and someone else is using version Y and it doesn't work, you know it's not a case of you have horrible things to do. The next thing I'm going to talk about, which is often missed, is we have to make it easy for developers. The strangest thing is, a lot of the things that are going to make it really easy for your users are the same things that make it easy for your developers. The whole point of this is you want people to take your code and put it somewhere or use it in a different way that you've never expected. Um, <clears throat> you want to make sure that they don't go through the same hell that you had to. You just want to make it easy. You just want people to contribute. You don't want them to have to research everything, learn how to set up their environment by themselves, and people will just get lost and not want to do anything extra. This is going to be another plug. Puppet approved. Please go for it. It is the best way to get your module noticed. It's also the best way to get people to contribute it's also the best way to learn some great coding practices. It's also a great way to meet other people in the community. It really opens up the world, and you get to meet people, some of the greatest people ever I have met through doing a Puppet Approved. But it's best to start with good practices early, and then you don't have much work to do. If you try and do all the things that I suggested before, it's so much work after you've got 50 resources and they all have 40 attributes each. It's so difficult. Don't make it difficult on yourself at the end. Start it from another good module and you have all the best practices for free. I'm also going to talk about another thing I love, which is acceptance testing. It is really cool. It is basically your guarantee that your code will continue to function after someone else has edited it. Or after you've edited it, and it just gives you peace of mind. It's just so good. The other thing I'm going to give a shout out to is um, Zach, Zach Reinhardt, about, or Reinhardt, about Rototiller, which is the greatest thing ever. I'm also going to show you the test that I wrote here. So as a personal story, what was really good was I actually ran my acceptance test before I started this talk to make sure that they worked. It made my life easier. So I'm going to go to another VM. Or sorry, I'm going to go back to my command line. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run my acceptance test. But before I do that, I'm going to show you my acceptance test, because otherwise it means nothing. So I'm going to test item potency here. I'm not sure if that's a word, but we're going to say it. Um, but really what we're going to do is we're going to change the state via manifest from off to on and on to off and change colors. The tests are simple. And the important thing about the test being simple is whenever someone else adds code or adds an attribute, they will be able to see what is happening. All they have to do is add in another attribute or add another test if they're interested in it. Copy pasta is the way to go. Make life easy. In fact, I would almost go as far to say if you had a golden PR where you do docs, where you do add an attribute or a feature and you add tests, you can point users at that and say, please copy this, and it will make your life easier. And it makes everything boring, because you look at a pull request and go, oh, it does that, and it has everything. It's really, really good. So what we're now going to do is run tests. And what could possibly go wrong with tests? There's a couple of environment variables here. Um, and all they're really saying is, I don't want to restart Vagrant and create a new VM. And the other thing is to say, please don't destroy the VM afterwards. So these, what you're about to see is an absolute stream of white text. And it doesn't really mean much. But what happens at the end is important. So yay, it failed. We'll look at that later. But what is important about it is 
I was able to run tests after changing code, and I got a failure. I know that there's something wrong now. That's what's important about this. I'm actually not gonna look into that error because I don't have much time. <laughs> so it's super important. It's a guarantee of the future. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is Puppet Device. It's not often talked about, but adding Puppet Device to your module isn't that hard. There isn't enough documentation around that, and we're gonna fix that. I think it's fantastic. And it allows you to do a lot of great things with Puppet Enterprise. It allows you to add Puppet Facts and do other things. But in reality, there's only a few files to add here, and actually most of it is just stubs. There isn't a huge amount in there if you don't want it to do a lot. So the really important thing is, where does this all lead? We've changed the color of some light bulbs. It's kind of interesting. I complained about documentation. My acceptance tests don't work. But it really does actually go somewhere super, super important. And where it goes is, if I can control a $10 light switch or a light bulb, what about a, your $100,000 Cisco switch or your NetScaler or your NetApp? Or can I control my air conditioning or my garage door? It's super important to say that we can control anything with an IP address, whether that be over HTTP, whether that be over gRPC, whether that be over NetConf, whether that be over SSH. We can control that stuff inside Puppet, and it's agentless as well. We don't need to cross-compile crazy C stuff to put it onto a device. Not to say that that's bad, but whenever we're dealing with lightweight things like this, why not do it? The other thing I would say is, please don't go for breadth first. Don't try and add 4,000 re resources and a billion attributes and put it up onto the forge. Start small, put something up there. You might get other people out there to help you with your code, even if it's just advice. The other thing I would say, people actually are at Puppet are using Puppet for their home automation, which sounds weird, but it's cool. So the other really super important thing that I'm gonna talk about, and I'm getting short of time, is this. Code generation. That's where it is. This is where it really starts to make sense. So you saw the code that I had there. It was basic code. We saw what the attributes look like inside our JSON. Why not auto-generate Puppet code? And there is a fantastic talk tomorrow from Rick Sherman. And well, I helped, out. I helped write this module, but pretty much all the code that we're demoing tomorrow was auto-generated. We used Yang. If you've ever heard of Yang, you're not. Well, if you've ever heard of Yang, you're probably the only person in this room. But what's super important about it is we use Yang to generate our types and providers and our testing. It's just so super powerful. It's just crazy. So although we only had a simple example there and it was simple code, going forward, you can start to look at code generation. And it's what we're starting to look at. And it's super, super important. And it was hopefully a simple demo. And that's me. The other thing. <clears throat> the other important thing I will say is vendors of applications and devices are now providing APIs into their systems. Everyone's doing it. So this is the way Puppet Code will be going, and it will go there in the future. So if you have any questions. Oh, uh, I think we've got a microphone. So. Please don't be a difficult question. <laughs> um, OK, I'll try. Um, so I've done this before, uh, managing an API. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote types and providers for it, but I couldn't really find a nice way to get credentials into the provider. Yes. I found a kind of clunky way of doing it. So I wondered if you had any um, recommendations, tips. yeah, tips. So what I would say is there are two real ways that we have written device modules at Puppet. One way are the cloud modules, so that's Azure, AWS, vSphere. And how they handle it is either through environment variables or through a configuration file. But generally, they only ever deal with one endpoint. So that's one side of it. If you look at the F5 REST module, or the NetApp and NetScaler, they use Puppet device. And so those four extra files, what they allow you to do is to set up a device.conf 
which sits beside your puppet.conf file, and it allows you to put in multiple nodes there with multiple um, um, authentication attributes, both IP address or keys. And so that's the best way. So there are two ways of doing it. Um, I would recommend starting off just doing it the really evil way that I did with environment variables, but going forward, Puppet Device is a way to handle multiple nodes. Actually, I was gonna kind of uh, tag onto that and uh, give you a, a plug for something that I wrote. Uh, it's a node encrypt module that allows you to manage uh, files uh, encrypted in the catalog, so you can share secrets without exposing them anywhere in the reports or in the catalog or anything. Yeah. Cool. Any further could, questions? Oh, yeah. Could you show what you did with uh, Puppet Device again? I, I think I missed uh, yeah. a little um, bit of the code. Yeah. So I don't really show, well, I'm not sure. Or I can show you the code if you want to see the code. Um, but in reality, there are a small number of files that you need to use to, do, to make your module um, Puppet Device. Um, in reality, what you're doing there is you abstract or you move your transport mechanism, my HTTP code, out. And the other bits and pieces of code that you have are a call to grab facts, which you then have to parse. And I may as well show you the code. So I'm going to show you code here and what could possibly go wrong. I will blow this up. So in here, we have some simple code. And it is really simple. This is a stub. There's not much there. We have our transport, which is creating our connection. Ignore the timeouts and stuff, but that's a single line that we showed earlier. Make it a little bigger. Oh, sure. Sorry, this is the connection code. So all it does is create a simple connection. And then I'm going to show you the other two files. So we have a fax file which really is another stump, uh, another stub, and you can see there that I return an empty hash of fax, but that's where your API calls would be if you want to return fax for a device. It's really simple, there isn't much there. It did take a lot of research to get this trimmed down. And here's the other piece of code, and this is your initialize and your fax, but in reality, whenever you're writing this code, um, you will probably change about four words. So. You will change it from my hue example. If you copy out this device code, you will change it to whatever the name of your module is. But in reality, it's super simple. I spent a lot of time with the other modules just trying to get rid of as much code as possible. So it is simple to do. It's not that evil. Um, yeah. So we have also done this, the talk that we're doing tomorrow about NetConf Yang. Um, I will probably post a gist of all the device or how that, how to write gist or how to write puppet device code. And in reality, you only touch five files. It, it isn't that complicated and it can be really simple. Once you want to do really clever stuff like have hundreds of facts, it's just multiple API calls. But it's simple. And that's hopefully what I have shown. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so, are all of the device examples or uh, modules on the Forge, are they all basically RESTful in the end? Because you can potentially use a slash proc and turn on and off various settings, or uh, if you have like a Raspberry Pi or mm -hmm. similar, you can open up ports, turn on PWM on various things, and um, maybe even take that a step further because that basically requires, um, I guess, uh, drivers and such. So but you can extend that and use like a fuse file system mm -hmm. and then have that in basically your local space and write and read file resources instead of trying to do RESTful stuff from within Puppet. And I'm just kind of curious if anybody has experimented with that yet. So Having come from, uh, I used to work for F5, and I, I did a lot of um, HTTP stuff. Um, I like RESTful stuff. So what I will say is um, 
I, I hear what you're saying about using that kind of interface and, or that kind of protocol. And what I would say is for our NetConf Yang, and I'm sorry to keep referring back to that, we did a gRPC interface, so that's HTTP2, and it's Google's way or next generation protocol um, library, which is awesome, by the way. And so that, isn't, that is sort of RESTful, but not really. It's stateful, and it does all sorts of clever things. So it isn't just JSON and HTTP calls. The other thing I would say is we were using SSH for our NetComp side of things, and we were use, you can use whatever Ruby libraries are out there and Ruby connection libraries that are there and do that if you want. Yes, you can do it in a file-based way, and yes, totally go with that, but th there's no reason not to do whatever you want. You could do it via SNMP. Don't do it via SNMP. <laughs> but it's totally possible to do whatever you want with it. Just still abstract it. Yeah. Uh, just still abstract and have it basically key value pairs within a puppet manifest Yeah. in the end. So and the other thing that I didn't even touch upon was I have completely abstracted the transport layer away from everything. It, there is no transport code except for in that parent class. And that's the important thing. And that enables you to make it puppet device or not puppet device. But taking all of that away and just having a simple type and provider, it makes it easy for other users to come along and add extra attributes or extra resources. So do whatever you want, basically. Any other questions? That's it. Okay. That's it. Thank you, TP. Thank you.